Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Board of Finance August meeting. I want to acknowledge Simsbury Community Media, who is filming this meeting with our thanks. We'll begin with the pledge. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have um, public audience on our agenda as we are being asked to approve supplemental appropriations in excess of what was approved during the budget. These will be funded primarily through grants and not through new, prop new property tax dollars. As is typical with all municipalities, under our transfer and supplemental appropriation policies, grants must can be appropriated at any time during the year upon the receipt of the grant. Of course, where possible, we do try to um, budget grants when that is um, reasonable or reasonably anticipated. Um, this is a limited public forum. Our board follows the town's anti-harassment policy and Robert's rules of order. Personal attacks are not permitted. As is our past practice, we invite members of the public to speak for three minutes on agenda items or any finance matters that they care to speak about. And I see Dr. Rinaldi here who mentioned that he would like to speak, so I'll start with him. Welcome. Dr. Rinaldi, can you come up and use, there's a mic on Amy's table that our uh, SCTV has asked. They prefer that you use that mic. So we can give it and you can look like Oprah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Mike Rinaldi. I live uh, on Bear Mountain, Pinnacle Mountain Road. <clears throat> the reason I'm here tonight is um, I think we're going in the wrong direction. I think the country's gone in the wrong direction, but I think we're going there too. We spend too much. We tax too much. We are the eighth highest equalized taxed people in Simsbury, in the state of Connecticut. And the state of Connecticut is the second highest tax state in the United States. That's not a good place to be. And why has this occurred? This hasn't been like this all the time. When I moved here 49 years ago, um, this town had taxation rates similar to Avon, a little higher than Farmington. <clears throat> but the word equalized is very important. You have to know what that means. That means um, your, the cost of real property being taxed is assessment times the mill rate. We have very high assessments here. And that's because we're a great town. We, great, we give great facilities. We, I think we're one of the only few towns that has a public country club. Um, we have an excellent school system. It's always been excellent. But it's poorly run, not educationally, but cost effectively. When I came here, town was about 12,000 people. Our K through 12 population was 5,700 students. Now we're more than double that population, and we're down below 4,000 students. And <clears throat> in the next 10 years, probably to 4,600. That's a 33% decrease in student population with over a doubling of the population. And we've made bad choices on the Board of Education. It seems like they're like the Keystone Cops. They, can, they can't get it right. When they did the Henry James project, could you imagine getting $200,000 to, to get a consultant to do a master plan? And then you go ahead with the project without, wait, without waiting six months till the consultant came in with his ideas. The idea said, you know, you should put the sixth grade in there. What did they do? Send it to the public for a referendum. Public doesn't know. Public doesn't even attend the meetings. They're a very smart group of electorates, but they're not very knowledgeable. So I wanted to get to the point where our 
general fund is just going out of, it's going highly out of proportion. Where uh, somebody told me it's seventeen million dollars in the general fund, it's earning uh, less than one percent interest. Who, in my lord name, takes seventeen million dollars and invests it at less than one percent? That and you have an eight to nine percent inflation rate. You're taking my money, giving it to, to a bank who's lending it out at four or five percent giving you less than 1% and inflation is running at 9 or 10%. That makes no sense. The problem was about <clears throat> 45 years ago, our general fund had about 10 to 12% reserves. And that was a, that was a good deal of reserves to, to have a triple A rating. And <clears throat> the problem with triple A rating, it's not everything, everybody says it, it's your reserve fund, it's your reserve, no, 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 no. The state of Connecticut has 22% reserve fund now. They have $6 billion in the bank, $22 billion budget, and they're double A rated. They just got double A rated because they have too many unfunded obligations. Their pension funds are not funded. Their health care funds are not funded. <clears throat> Simsbury, we do a fantastic job. Our pensions are funded to be 70%. Our health care are funded. Um, <clears throat> we have basically um, have a balanced budget all the time. And we produce revenues and, and <clears throat> to the point where we have a collection rate of close to 100%, 99.8% or something like that. That's unheard of. And we keep all this money in reserve. The problem is, as our budgets increase 3 to 4% per year, we have to increase our general fund 3 to 4% per year. <clears throat> and we're already at $17 million, collecting nothing. The problem with being a triple, everybody, we have to be triple A. We have to be triple A. It's almost spasmodic. Triple A. It's basically based on your grand list growth, your population growth, your mean, ho mean household income, town management of your finances, balanced budgets, status of your infrastructure, are you, have, do you have crime or not crime? Are you a safe place to live? We're, we're just taxing too much and we're spending too much. A typical example is our public country club. When I came here in 1972, the first thing they did is they took me up to Simsbury Farms. They take everybody there. That's the first place you go. And um, I was impressed. It's a nice place. But in the town referendums, I mean, before the town referendums, we used to have town meetings. I mean, you talk about something that was unusual. A town meeting where everybody got together. They discussed the budget and they voted right then and there. It was true democracy at its, at its best. The people who were there at the time, after about four or five years in the mid-70s, early 80s, always complained. Why isn't Simsbury Farms producing any income? When that place was built, the town's pay, the town's uh, payer, uh, people, they put up the money to bond and pay for that structure, and they've been paying for it ever since. But the one thing that was made present at that time was it would produce income to the town. It's never produced a cent. It's about five million dollars in the past 50 years in the rears. Oops. One more minute. Yeah, if you could just wrap it up. I'm so. the only guy here. Yeah, <coughs> that's why I'm giving is, him more the time. The thing is that the people who make the, who, who, who do the fees up there are the people who sit on the commission up there. They say, well, if we raise the fees, people won't come. Well, there's a system up there whereby it's means tested. You, you, if you can't afford it, you can still go there. They'll write, they'll reduce your your your, your costs. So what? Well, all that I wanted to say today was we spend too much.
Thank you. We tax too much. We, we invest our money foolishly. Give me that money, I'll invest it at six or seven percent. I don't have to have the town, and they say, well, the town can't do it because they are in statute, they can't do it. That's another reason. Drop the thing down to 12, 13, 14 percent, which is realistic. It's going up 17, 18 percent. That's just unfair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rinaldi. Okay. Is there anyone else who wants to speak for a public audience? Um, Dr. Rinaldi, I just wanted to let you know we've got the chair of the Board of Ed here and that they offer public audience both before their meetings and at the end of the meetings if you ever want to um, address them as well. So, um, a quick... Lisa, this is Linda. Just want to let you know I've joined. Excellent. Hi, Linda. How are you? Hey, how are you? <laughs> A quick update, earlier um, before this meeting we had an executive session um, for the board where we received an update on the town's cyber risk profile and how appropriate investments and mitigation measures are being taken to minimize risk and what additional resources may be needed in the future. I want to thank those who were able to attend. We do this in executive session, obviously, um, because of the security um, discussions that happen during that time. Sensitivity but of the information. Thank you. Sensitivity of the information. I'm going to use that next time. All right. We will start with the finance director's report. Okay. So um, under the grants and donations, just one Steve grant application that's been put in at the last um, Board of Selectmen meeting on August 8th. And then for our property appraiser position, um, some very exciting news here. We had the position that was reposted the last time I reported out. We did have the second set of interviews at the beginning of August. Our preferred candidate was identified. Um, he did meet with the town manager for his final interview, and um, I actually found out right before I came here um, that we did provide him with an offer letter, and he did accept. So he has a tentative start date of September 6th, a little later than I wanted, but he's on vacation this week. So um, we'll make it work. The assessor did reach out to the revaluation company um, for additional inspection services, and she was notified through um, through the vendor that assist that they have been assisting various towns because of staff shortages, and they weren't sure about the level of backlog inspections that they would be able to complete with us. But since now we have an official notice of acceptance from our property appraiser, Francine can work on divvying up the between our contractor and our new property appraiser to see if we can capture as much of the backlog as possible. So more to come on that in your next update at the next meeting. Um, the pension fund experience study update, nothing really new here. Um, as promised at the last meeting, the, um, the census items would be sent over to Milliman so they could get going on the experience study. That was achieved, so Milliman is in receipt of all of our census information so they can get going on the experience study. Um, the American Rescue Planning Act funding update, we were supposed to re receive our second tranche of funding um, June 2022. However, that did not come to fruition. The state got the money late from the federal government, and so therefore we got our money late. Just a quick update um, to the update that's in here. It says that we received the funding on August 10th. We did receive some of the funding on August 10th. We received the town portion, about $1.2 but there's a separate county allocation. It's about 2.4 million that has not been received yet. So they did notify us that that will be coming later. Um, the fraud tip hotline, this is some- Before you move on, where do we house that? That sits in the special revenue fund for our- It does. Mm -hmm. Yep. The fraud tip hotline, this is something that I had um, discussed with Lisa Pryor. Um, she had inquired if we had one. Um, she had seen Avon and I believe Glastonbury, they had posted on their site. We actually have the same fraud tip hotline. Avon actually got theirs from us. They had reached out to me about who we have. Um, so per her request, we put up, there's just like this little fraud hotline poster that we put up on the town manager's page as, as well as the finance site on the town website so everybody can see where you can go. Um, there's actually a, a lot of things that you can report on other than fraud. There's obviously the misappropriations, conflict of interest, um, violations of laws. I think there's harassment. There's um, a whole array of things that can be reported on this fraud hotline and you are anonymous. And then the last item is the Latimer Lane update. This is an update from Jason Casey who's the project manager. Um, and just a quick brief summary of where we are with the tentative schedule. There was a PBC meeting, I believe, last week. The 8th, Monday. The 8th. 
um, and they moved out um, the amount of time that they were going to utilize to review their bids. So this schedule was moved out a week from that point. So on 10-17, the Public Gift Building Committee will meet to review the bids, and then we have to reassess the meeting schedules after that for the Tri Board, the Board of Education, the Board of Selectmen, and the Board of Finance meeting subsequent to then. We're still shooting for a December 3rd referendum, um, but like I said, we need to reestablish the dates of the boards to make it go through the process. Why don't we open it up for comments? I'm going to start with Linda because um, we won't know if she has her hand up. If you have any comments, Linda. Um, just, just a question. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> um, I, it's a little hard for me to hear, but uh, it, it sounds like we have a, a person who's going to join CMC and staff, which is great news. I'm thrilled about that. Um, but that the existing contractor said they could not help us at this time. And so my question is, are we talking to any other contractors? So it's not that they can't help us, they just can't help us in the capacity, the full capacity of the backlog. Um, so we were waiting until we had a person on board so that Francine can go back and establish can they help us with a part of it if we give some of it to the property appraiser that's coming on board or would we, I mean, I don't know if we could even seek outside services at this point. I can ask Francine just because it's so close to, I mean, we're, we're within a month's time of the October 1 deadline. We're in a month's time of what? The October 1st deadline. And what's that deadline about? So your grand list is, at, is as of October 1st. So everything needs to be captured by then. And then that's what she reports on for the upcoming grand list. Do we so have the whole next year is dependent upon what happens in the next month? Pretty much. Do we have an idea of the person yes. status? Yes. yes. Do we have an idea of status? Do we think we're going to hit Francine's number? Do we think we're going to be off 20%, 30%? Do we have an idea yet? So she has some numbers that she's put together, but they're kind of obsolete at this point since we were notified that we're going to get the property appraiser. So she would have to reestablish what those um, estimates look like. So we can have that for you at the next meeting. This is just, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just whine for a moment because th this, is, this is why I wanted to make, and all of us wanted to make such a high priority on getting any kind of resources, no matter what it took, in the door as fast as possible. And it's deeply disappointing to me to hear that we are now a month away, that we've been talking about, hey, we have the opportunity to get an additional $3 million next year. And we're a good chance we're not going to get that with only a month to go and a brand new person coming on isn't going to, you know, hit the floor running that fast. But it's not all contingent on the new person and the contractor. A lot of it's going to be captured during the reval that they're already doing the contracted services for. So if, if perhaps oh, Francine. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, just if you get an update from Francine, if you could send that before the next meeting, that sure. might be helpful. Okay. Um, does anyone else have questions? No, I don't. I have just a few minor questions. Um, we're, one thing, um, Linda, that may be helpful to you when we do our budget analysis, we're going to look at what happens if we don't get the full grant list, what that might mean to taxes. That'll be one of the uh, factors we'll be able to manipulate. And so we'll have an idea of how big an impact that may or may not have on the budget. Um, I know Amy was going to pull together at some point, and you may not have had a chance to do that, and that's totally fine if you haven't, but the balance of unplanned uses for ARPA. I have that. Did I lose you guys? No, we're just waiting for Amy's just looking up a document oh. for us. Amy. And Amy, while you're doing that, I'll just speak because I've already spoken to you and you've already said yes, but for members of the public, um, I was going to ask Amy to please uh, ask Francine to give us an update on elderly tax credits, comparing um, how many people applied for them this year as opposed to last year. That will give us a first insight as to how our population is feeling. You know, are we doing well or are we not? They're sort of the canary in the coal mine. 
Um, so I will try to turn that off and back on so that you all can see it. But the allocation balance for Arbor is um, 4610000 of unassigned. So we had um, just a, a, a brief refresher, about $7.5 million. During the fiscal year 23 budget process, we allocated 3.165. And then um, we had some supplementals for fiscal year 23 for the Farmington Valley Health District, the Housing Authority, and the nonprofit grant program. So this is about 350,000. Um, there's about 242,000 um, left from the first tranche, and then the balance of the second tranche. Um, we have about four million. But uh, Wendy, the Board of Selectmen has tentative plans for a lot of that. Some of it's in the CIP and other programs. Is that right? This year? For the next tranche. The next tranche, there's some, are you talking about the budget items in 24? We have a few budget items in out years for 24, 25, 25, 26, 26, 27. Yes. That's okay. what you're asking about? Yep. Yep, Lake Bazil Dam, the um, Pond Bridge Dam, and, um, you know, HVAC. Yep. Those are the ones that are in the out years. And um, we still have a potential use for this year for the, if we do a business program, which we're evaluating right now, and that we were hoping we would use what the remainder of tranche one, because we hadn't gotten tranche two yet. So we don't want to. And we have the, of course, Latimer Lane 1.5 million that we've assigned, but, we but not, not appropriated. Yes. So when you add all that up as to things you're thinking about, I come up with about seven million that is already sort of thought about. So it doesn't leave us a lot of flexibility in, unless we review some of the initial proposals. Seven million okay. counting what we've already said. Okay, I'm just looking ahead actually, so. Yeah. So that's just as we think about what buckets we have for capital going forward. Um, and then Amy, have we had any updates on uh, the 501c3 application are people applying we have not we have not received any applications oh. Oh. Okay. and then on the date um and i mentioned this with amy and i know tom is aware too um the latest update we have didn't actually have the date for the board of finance hearing so we'll schedule that once we get the other to be determined amounts in there yeah so that's on the schedule on the to be, to be determined board of finance meeting to review additional appropriation requests and set public hearing date but there is no public hearing date Right, you have to set it. Yeah, okay. All right. Then on the Latimer, we've got Sue Selina here. <laughs> Did you want to give us any updates on Latimer and what your process is and what you'll be looking at? We, at this point, we are um, much like you, we're going to wait until the bids are opened and we get that recommendation coming from people to say, and then we'll discuss it. Um, We'll all be, hopefully, we'll, all three boards will attend that tri-board meeting and get the full presentation, have the opportunity to ask questions of the construction company and Tecton, and then um, our board will figure out where we want to go with those recommendations. All right, I know you had a question. Well, yeah, uh, an embarrassing question, but I'm reading the, uh, the report on on the budget uncertainties, and I don't know what the alternates are that come to $1.8 million. The, so there is a list of ad alternate packages um, that was part of our Board of Education um, meeting the other night. There are eight packages with varying dollars from included at, included at the PBC, they added the geothermal wells, which um, is the biggest driving factor. It's 1.1 1 .1 million. So the, these are, are proposals that were They're not all proposals in the not budget. in the nope. These they, were all. They, they bid it as there's like a base bid, and then like if you want to go from a stone dust uh, sidewalk to something, you know. Say so instead of stone dust, you know, simple paths that get the job done to something that you really want the school to look like, which would be concrete walks. And I, I would say this is very much like when we've all bought a car. Right. There's the base model, nice. and that's the bid. But if you want those 15-inch rims, Bert, yeah. it's going to cost you this much extra. Right. That, that's an owner's contingency. That should be in an owner, owner's contingency line item, right? 
because well, you, you, you have a whether it's a oak cabinet or a pine cabinet right okay. you know what you're gonna you know you need that it's just what level spec you want right so that should be yeah, it, it shouldn't be new it, that that's well, that's the, the that's the known unknown well, some of these things though are new because we didn't like the geothermal wells were not part of our original conversation so that, that right. came to us through PBC so we didn't that was that was a little bit of a, a conversation I suppose with the clean energy task force to try to put that in if appropriate but that's a that's a big ask yeah we had we had known that that opportunity was there and I think in, at least initially we thought that that was going to be kind of put a lot put on the side until we knew more I guess so I, it's good that we know kind of what that number is I right guess. so these things are all on the side until we know more so we need the base bid back so we can see what sort of room there is and where we want to go because we don't want to build the building and not give the kids what they need yep so, so, yeah. oh, no I was just gonna say that it looks like well, so the additional alternates are 1.8, 1.9. The base overages are 4.1, which I thought were in the threes, in the, in the three but million. But Tecton range. says they think that's a big overestimation. So I think, again, we're going to need to wait and see what comes back because you have two, two groups who know more about the building than I do who disagree. Totally. And it also depends on where you are in the, in the drawing process. So it says here that the construction manager that said that the design documents are done so you're not at construction drawing stage yet or are you i think they're just wrapping them up right they, now. they completed construction documents on july 7th so the complete set like yes. this okay so plans and specs are 100 percent complete okay so and then how long will the contractors hold their bids they they were asked to hold it for 90 days Okay, and when do we begin construction, or when do we the, break ground? Uh, the, ten the tentative plan is to do site work yep. beginning in November. Okay, okay. All right, that's that's good. That makes me feel better. Okay, a couple um, questions. Um, first of all, thank you for your work. I know this is complicated, and it's complicated in part because the strange inflation and supply chain issues that we've never seen. So we, we do understand and appreciate that there are some things that are out of your control and that we're all trying to figure out. One of the things our board has to figure out is how to pay for it and what to pay for based on your recommendation, the Board of Selectmen's recommendation. Um, and to do that, we need pieces of information so we understand what buckets are available to us. And one piece of information that would be helpful if you do go the geothermal way or with any additional energy upgrades um, if you could please let us know what these upgrades will mean in terms of return on investment I've talked with Tom or total cost of the project you know replacement if we can look at it over the life of the 50-year life of the building because there's the classic example in school building do you put in the I forgot, is it marble floor or the uh, linoleum? Linoleum is cheap initially, but if you look at the total cost over the life of 50 years, it's quite a bit more expensive. So we are cognizant of that, but we would like to see that analysis. If yeah, we would be looking, I, I don't think we'd recommend that without knowing that ourselves. Excellent, thank you. And then um, the other thing we'll need is mostly from Amy. We have a, just, a, I was talking with Matt Curtis, and we said we've got a couple of freight trains coming on at us all at once this year, unfortunately. One of them is debt service is going to rise by about $1.7 million in next year's budget. So think about what your normal budget is. The Board of uh, Selectmen's budget is normally 600000 and just debt service is going to raise one point seven. So that's number one challenge. Number two, um, our pension investments, we have a report in our um, agenda. And as with everyone else, the investments are a little bit lower than our target, which is 6.5%. There's been some recovery in the market, so we don't know what that's going to impact the ARC, but that may be an increase in the ARC payment, so that's the second freight train. Obviously, we're watching in the news health increases are going up, so if we can't, we do have sufficient reserves, and if those hold, we may be able to tap those, but if they don't hold, then that will be a cost coming at us. Um, we have an experience study. Did I mention that? 
uh, Amy mentioned it. Yeah, so we, the experience study, we look at the actual cost of the pensions, and mostly when you do an experience, that can result in an increased cost, but, once in, but not necessarily, and we don't know what that's going to be. But Amy is talking with our auditor to make sure we have that information before we go into um, this decision making. <coughs> I think, you know, as we know, we've assigned $1.5 million. We can do that fairly easily on current costs. I mean, that's already been planned for. As we get higher that number, it gets more complicated, and we'll probably have to pick things out of the CIP or CNR that we're, we want to do but they, we can't do. So that may require an updated C, CIP. So I just wanted to um, uh, mention that publicly. And of course, the updated CIP is important because that tells us our debt service. And if we're going to do new bonding, um, that elevates um, probably the attention we're going to give to this. So just putting all that out there. And then, of course, we're in the middle of union negotiations, as always. So we'll see how. And we're going to get an update on that at the end of the meeting. So those are all sort of the freight chains, unfortunately, coming at us at the same time. Um, so how do we make this all fit? The good news is, and it's both good and bad news, is we have the potential for a good grandless growth this year, and which is why you know Linda was talking about and Amy has um, really been working hard to hire someone. So if we can capture enough of that grandless, we can do this. If we don't capture a lot of the grandless, it's going to be very challenging. So we're all sitting on pins and needles, and poor Francine is working so hard over there with her team and Amy, and I, I want to acknowledge them and thank them, but you know, everybody be nice to Francine and Amy, because they're <laughs> working really hard on this grand list, and everything depends on the grand list. And we're going to play with some of those numbers um, in the future to sort of see, okay, well, if the grand list comes in at only 900,000 as opposed to 3.9 million, different choices get made. So we'll be looking at that. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say on that. But is there anything else our board members feel they're going to need before we make that decision other than what I mentioned? I just have one follow-up question. On the geothermal, was that part of the original budget that went to referendum for the public to vote on? So it would be an, it's an added item. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so Optically, it looks like we're trying. We might be just trying to add something that you know in piecemeal, which isn't really consistent with the original budget. But again, that's um, that's that's fine. Um, I guess we will have more discussions about that. I think it would be helpful if you know Jeff and I'm, I, I can't pronounce his last name, Wazinski. but say it again. Wazinski. Wazinski. Thank you. I, you know, I, I worked with him a lot in, in the original meetings that we had and in, in kind of deciding the, the master plan. And he's not just worked on projects in Simsbury, but all over the state and others. Um, so I think he could be really helpful in kind of determining trends, uh, recent trends, in terms of what we should be kind of earmarking for contingencies and unknowns um, and what that should look like such that I don't. I don't think we need perfect information to go to referendum um, because even if those contractors bid what they bid and say they're going to hold them for 90 days, there's no assurances there um, unless it just works different in the public process. But at least in, in my experience, um, you know, sometimes contractors go away and, and you can't track them down. Um, but I think it would be helpful for him, long story short, to kind of get in front of us and tell them because the numbers have varied in terms of what we think the overages are just to give us kind of what he thinks we should be earmarking for contingencies and escalations in specific line items like lumber or concrete which you know is very fuel intensive and um, you know as you know with lumber has been all over the place you know I think with the recent housing report you know uh, building is down, which may, you know, bring some relief to commodity pricing. But I, I r rather than just kind of see this uh, on a week, uh, monthly basis, it would be nice to just get some assurances from him that we're looking at it the right way. And I know he's been a part of the building, public building uh, committee meetings as well. Um, but I think for the benefit of the Board of Finance, it, it would might just put some perspective around, well, how conservative is it? You know, walk us through why it's conservative. And then, you know, whether, whether the contracts come back within 
two, five, ten percent of what we think it is from Jeff's perspective. Again, it doesn't need to be perfect to put it in front of the public. Um, it's kind of where where I'm at. Um, but you know, that I don't know if that's possible. Maybe at our next meeting, if Jeff's available. But um, I don't know if anybody else has any yeah. thoughts so on the, that. So the as the project has gotten into the drawing, the construction drawings and all the so the main architect we're working with now is a gentleman by the name of Justin Hopkins. But Jeff is still involved. Okay, so great. when we go when we go to like a state meeting, that's happening Wednesday morning for or I guess this morning. Um, tomorrow morning. <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning. I lost track of my days here. Um, Jeff is still involved, but for the most part, um, the the most knowledgeable person at TechDone now is this Justin Hopkins, who's the project lead. Okay. But Jeff, I agree in terms of the overall marketplace, is an excellent resource. Okay, so maybe if we could coordinate with Amy and see if it's possible for our September meeting. Thank you. Thank you for that offer. Any other questions on Latimer? Or anything else on Amy's uh, financial director's report? First of all, I, I do want to acknowledge Amy. It's a concise two-page report, but it takes hours to put together and a lot of data to um, consolidate. And so I do want to recognize that and thank her, and also thank her for her work on the um, fraud hotline. Um, Lisa, yeah, enough. go ahead. Um, so I, I hate to sound like a broken record, and I certainly don't want to, uh, I do want to recognize all of the work that uh, Francine and, and Amy have been doing. I do have a follow-up question on my my, um, my my topic of continual interest these days, which is the revenue side of things. Um, we've talked about for some months putting out an RFP and getting a consultant in the fall to do a best practices review and um, and I would urge a sample um, sampling to, to test accuracy of what's in our files versus what exists in the real world. Has there been any work done on that? I don't think so. I think Francine is significantly just concentrated on the reval right now, but I can do a follow up with her for you. Just Amy, as a, Amy and Linda, I think Fran it, I think um, Francine told us at the hearing that she would start that after October 1. Oh, that's right. Because of the uh, stress of the and the time constraints of the reval. So I think her plan was to start it after October 1. So I, I would not okay, expect I, her to I may have misunderstood. I thought it would be, you know, that starting it meant it would. Oh. Um, that the contract would start at, at, in October. I, I didn't. I didn't understand it as that there would be no work on it until after then, but I, I, I stand corrected. Okay. Any other questions on finance? Okay. So we will move on to our first supplemental appropriation, uh, LOTSIP, which stands for Local Transportation Capital Improvement Grant, and the Connecticut Community Connectivity Grant, CCCGP. The Firetown Sidewalk Gap Closure. Um, before us is a request to approve a supplemental appropriation from LOTSIP for $1.2 million, a supplemental appropriation from the Community Connectivity Grant for $594,000, and after speaking with council who spoke with our bond council, the motion will be for us to uh, do a supplemental appropriation from capital reserves. And there's a lot of legal um, back and forth and if you want me to go into it I will but <laughs> I hope you guys will say we'll just do it out of um, capital reserves and then next year budget cycle we can reduce the sidewalk uh, grant then instead of doing a transfer so that's okay. sort of the background there but I wanted to um, open it up to Tom and remind folks this is part of, I, I don't know if folks had a chance, but I sent you the link to the pedestrian um, bicycle master plan. This is recommended by the pedestrian bicycle master plan. It's gone through planning an 824 referral uh, that I spoke with the chair and she said that was approved unanimously. And I think from the Board of Selectmen, was this a unanimous recommendation? Yes. Okay. So Tom, why don't you tell us a little bit about this? As I, as I said to the Board of Selectmen the other day, we actually had a unique, unique situation where we've put in um, grants for this particular sidewalk gap that was identified in the uh, Pedestrian Bicycle Master Plan, I think four times. 
Um, we came very close to getting the Connecticut Connectivity Grant a couple of years ago. They told us we were essentially next on the list. Uh, when we saw the opportunity to reapply for LOTSIP in the last go around, uh, we basically refreshed our application. Um, while that process was going on, our friends at DOT called us and told us that they actually <coughs> had funds left over and asked us if we would still like to be considered for that grant. Um, so we actually have a little bit of an embarrassment of riches and we we're able to get both of the sidewalk grants, which especially considering um, the current market and inflation is going to be nice. Um, but we need to certainly um, have the supplemental appropriation to receive the grants. And then there is that transfer of funds, which is required for the surveying. The town under both of these grants is responsible for doing the design work, which includes surveying. Um, the survey is $35,000 and the design work, which has a value of about $100,000, is going to be done in-house. Okay. Oh, it's great. Up for questions from the board? I, I do have a few, but would anyone like to just, Linda, do you have any questions on this? Oh, thank you. Anyone else? No. Yeah. Um, so, Tom, can you speak a little bit, for new sidewalks, it's actually quite a bit more expensive than refurbishing as we saw That's from correct. your submission almost like eight to ten times more so and I noticed yeah. there's a difference in square foot cost for this project versus hot meadow can you talk about why this is more expensive than the hot meadow project uh, I, I think you have to look at the complexity um, in this corridor as you start going from West Street up to Plank Hill um, really a good question in fact we were talking about it in the hall beforehand is which side of the road does the sidewalk really want to be on um, that was one of my questions. Wait, so. <laughs> wait, and, and I'll be honest, the answer is not finite at this time. We certainly did a preliminary design where we think that it's going to be on the west side, just based upon the topography and the trees along the east side at either end. In the middle, it would be great to be on the east side where you're going in front of governor's um, house, as opposed to being near the golf course. Um, the reality of the safety of the crossings and everything else, right now we're currently looking as if it's going to be on the um, west side, which would be the Hot Meadow Country Club side. The nice thing about having the little bit of extra money associated with the two grants is it's going to allow us to do some additional plantings and things to make sure that we have separation between the sidewalk and the golf course so that this one doesn't look like a cart path. Two, in, it will aesthetically be pleasing to keep a little separation. And three, in case there's a bad golfer out there, the sidewalk folks are going to be protected. <laughs> That's me when I'm on the golf course. <laughs> we're not, not, we're not trying to sing <laughs> pedestrians walking. It just happens to go that way. Um, will this be like the trail on West Street, or is it going to be sidewalks? Um, We're currently proposed doing this as concrete sidewalk. So it would be five feet wide as a traditional sidewalk. And five feet and then off the curb? Like if it, in it, it, would, it would vary depending upon um, the topography of the landscaping. Um, in the case of um, the curvature of Firetown Road, we have some guardrail. We have to decide mm -hmm. which side of the sidewalk the guardrail is going to be. Traditionally, guardrail is on the outside of the sidewalk, mm -hmm. which takes a little second for you to get your head into that where you're saying the car is going to go across the sidewalk before it hits the guardrail. What happens to people walking? But that's traditionally where it's gone. It's, again, it's something that we'll look at carefully during design. And who is responsible for shoveling? The adjacent property owner. So um, one of the questions I had, it, having worked on sidewalks on West Street, as you may recall, I think you were with me back in 2012 <laughs> when we did that, there was a lot of notification that went to homeowners before the project came for a vote. So there were letters, we had multiple hearings, multiple uh, you know, public audiences on it. Can you talk to us about what outreach has been done to the homeowners and, or what is planned? Okay. There, there was some outreach during all of these various grant processes. We actually had a number of um, businesses and residents in the general area that supported the project with letters. Um, it was actually a really good grant um, submission. It was, it was one that I can tell you I was very happy with the fact that we had supporting letters from um, some students that actually lived in the apartments off of West Street and basically said, we can't walk to school. So how, how was the public notified that we were applying for that other than sort of agenda items? Just, just through agenda items at this point. Now as we're about to start seeing some field work and we're going to have surveyors out there um, this fall, we're just now starting to do two processes. Um, we're going to be doing our public outreach and then we're also going to be hiring surveyors at the same time. But we're still a solid month, month and a half away before, from any work getting done. Okay. And then in terms of operating costs for the town? Uh, de minimis being that we are not responsible for the um, 
shoveling in this particular case, we would simply have the recapitalization cost, but the concrete sidewalk is going to last 40 years, give or take. Um, so, you so really get. Linda, point. can I jump in? And sure. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I too heard from a constituent um, who I think raised some very valid questions, and it's, it's sounding to me, Tom, like um, that this constituent at least was not aware that uh, until now that sidewalks were being considered. And uh, given that you're, you're saying we're six weeks away from doing any work, it sounds like a fait accompli that if public um, input were to be that they don't want the sidewalks or, you know, it's a big burden. And, and I'm actually thinking of um, Hot Metal Country Club, too, if they're expected to pay the expense all winter long of shoveling that sidewalk, that's not an insignificant expense because it's a pretty long piece of distance. I mean, I have no idea. I haven't talked to them, but um, maybe they already shovel there. <clears throat> uh, <pardon>. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they're closed in the winter or, or what, but I, I mean, I don't think we've, we've kind of checked out what what people are, how the, how the people who will be affected are going to be affected and how they feel about it. Uh, and, I, and I'm concerned that there is not much time or room for addressing their concerns at this point. I think so far down the road. <coughs> Well, Linda, I think um, you have to parse out what, what we're saying. We're talking six weeks before we begin even looking at the survey. Um, if far, we are months and months away from actually getting into construction. And with all projects, okay. if there was, if there was I, some... I couldn't quite hear what you said. I just heard the six weeks away from work, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I want to make sure nobody mis mishears this in the meeting, that we're ready to start construction in six weeks. Absolutely not the case. We're ready to start doing the survey and the design work in six, six to eight weeks. Um, um, but but with, is it a, it's a done deal that there will be a sidewalk, it's just a question of what it looks like and which side of the road it's on? No, the town always has the ability to get into design and say that we want to turn these grants back. I think it would be um, a shame because, again, there was a, a large amount of support for this project in the larger um, bicycle pedestrian master plan, which a huge part of that was public outreach and getting to hear what residents want. And when you look back at that process, one of the things that was really interesting to me is, you know, as somebody who works here every day and I've worked with um, the bicyclists in town, and we thought we knew what the answers were going to be. And I was shocked at how many people in Simsbury wanted sidewalks. The challenge is everybody wants sidewalks on the other side of the street. It's, yeah. it, it's, no, it, I, I'm yeah. a big advocate of, of uh, enabling kids to walk to school or bike to school also, rather than having your parents drive them or take a bus or whatever. So. I, I, I get the, the purpose of all of this. I think we just have to be very sensitive to the people who will be affected, um, but not necessarily benefit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and like I said, I think this is definitely one where it's, it's, it's government trying to do the right thing, and um, it, there's never going to be a perfect sidewalk project. Um, and the other thing that, it, you know, it's always an option. It's not something that I would recommend, but there are communities in other states that they take on management of all of the snow removal on sidewalks. It would be a massive undertaking. So not, not this year with the freight trains coming. <laughs> no, and, and, and I think to Dr. Noldy's stand, standpoint, you, <laughs> no. I'm not suggesting this at any point, but I'm saying, you know, there is a level of what do you want to do. Uh, Neil, with children walking to school on this pathway, will there be a need for school crossing guards? along that route now? I mean, I, I work with the police on that, actually, like usually, right about now, as school is opening. Um, so I'm sure I'm gonna get a call from downstairs in the next week. Um, they do an analysis of where they can, crossing guards aren't that easy to find. Right. We've had vacancies the last couple of years. Um, but they, they always, um, they consult with me if we have received any feedback for changes. But otherwise, they recommend where crossing guards go. So I would defer to them over with her. So there could be a crossing guard expense for you. Yeah. The average salary for a crossing guard, and since I know in Connecticut, I just Googled it before we came, is about 27000 a year. Is that consistent? Uh, our crossing guards are not making that. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the sidewalks aren't for the ex explicit use of, of students. So I don't know if we're going to have a crossing guard at every major crosswalk in town. Just for people who decide to walk to school, but 
Yeah. I, I, do I don't want to, yeah, I, it's good that we know what that number is, but. Just um, for planning. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it begs the question with Henry James right there. Yeah. Right. You know, so it's. So there may be. Um, I did talk with Susan Sleet, I'm sorry she left. I asked her who's going to use this. And what she, one of the things she pointed out that I didn't know and members of the public might not know is that a lot of the high school teams practice their junior varsity sports or even some of their varsity sports at the middle school. And there's a bus that will take the kids there, but some children opt to, or teenagers, I should say, young adults, opt to walk there. And so this will give them a way of getting there other than the bus, or if they need to come back to the high school for some reason, they could walk back. So I, that was information to me that I was not aware of. Um, Tom, you said you've heard from people who want it. Was it mostly parents, or who, uh, who wants this? Governor's Bridge actually wrote a letter in support of it. Um, and like I said, there were some students. Um, one particular student wrote a very nice letter, um, and she was down in the apartments off of West Street. And if I, if I have it, I'm, I'll, I'll try later. I'll, I'll email you the actual application. I think it was pretty good. Oh, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, and then one question one of the constituents asked me was, do you anticipate any trees being cut down in the construction process? There will certainly be um, some level of tree removal. Um, we will follow the state law on that, which requires us to post them in accordance with the tree warden statute uh, 10 days before removal. There is a process where if somebody was particularly aggrieved about a particular tree, it had a particular value, um, we have a public hearing, um, give everybody the chance to listen before we do any tree removals. And just having had minor experience with this on the West Street sidewalk, I do know that you have the ability to go around trees in some situations. So I assume you'll take that into account as well. As, as one of my many jobs here, I'm tree warden. I don't <laughs> cut down trees if we don't have to. <laughs> Eversource, on the other hand. <laughs> No, but people may not know that. I mean, people look and they think, oh, there's a tree there, but they're going to have to cut it down. That's not always necessarily the case. Sometimes it, 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 exactly right. And, and not to jump ahead, but as we look at the north end sidewalk, there's one tree in particular. Um, as we get to it, we're going to do our best to try to save it. Okay. So because the motion has changed, I'm going to go ahead and ask for a motion. I'm going to ask Amy to listen carefully and make sure I get the motion right. Can we open it up for a discussion oh, I, or yeah, questions? Yeah, sure. Um, I just curious Tom is this just real is the notification really just a matter of public courtesy because we're dealing with kind of a right aways here correct that, that, that would be accurate I think we've always tried to um, involve the public as, most, yep. as best we can yep. we've tried to be as open and transparent in all the things we sure do. and I've always found it's a lot easier to have a conversation months in advance than it is as bulldozers are making their way up the street no absolutely totally agree and it's just me not not knowing if there's any requirement when, when it comes to sidewalk work um, and then um, liability who carries the liability for someone who either what presumably should be on the opposite side of the barrier gets hit by a vehicle on the sidewalk or a slip and fall or you know who who pays for that i'm not an attorney i didn't stay the holiday in <laughs> but let me just tell you the important things to, to keep in mind one of the things that always happens with sidewalks is small defects are the responsibility of the budding property owner and part okay. of the reason for that is your typical sidewalk offset from a tree root or something right. and you get a slip and fall or a trip and fall yeah and part of the reason as i understand that's always been the case is because the abutting property owner has the ability to visually see that where i can't see every right. sidewalk every day that's right so there's right. a level of shared responsibility the town certainly with deep pockets is always going to get brought into that mm -hmm. and in the event and we hope it's never going to happen in terms of some level of car leaving the roadway yeah it, it it's going to be a horrific mess and where it's yeah. important is to make sure that the engineering design has been done to all of the appropriate standards mm -hmm. and the appropriate professional conduct is is adhered to understood okay thank you but derek you raise a good point there will be some responsibilities on the homeowners the biggest financial is financial well. yeah. yes yeah. and so that's um that's something that we're all conscious of uh, i don't know wendy do, do you want to speak to any of this i don't think so i think i covered everything i was going to mention that we heard from the resident today but it sounds like um we will be doing outreach to people so that they know and that it's based on good reasons Anyone else? Yeah, I just point out that the exposure of the homeowners is different once the uh, uh, sidewalk's been 
laid down, but they have exposures in the absence of sidewalks mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And then the seventy-five percent of that project is potentially country club. Yeah. Mm. So it's not homeowners; it's one property owner. We we had conversation with them um, a couple years ago when we were doing the the first application. And like I said, we also work very closely with um, Governor's House. And if we one of the many concepts that still could come to fruition is that the sidewalk changes which side of the road it's on along that length. Mm -hmm. The problem is balancing out the risk of having a crossing Cross. mm -hmm. yeah. on a curve on yeah. a road which right. people are not always driving as slow as we'd like them no. to. <laughs> but you have had conversations with the top and on Bellevue one, Governor's House. Very much so, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Any other questions? Linda, anything you want to add? Uh, I would just add that um, actually all of the land of Hot Meadow Country Club is rented by the Country Club from McLean. They are the property owner. So you probably want to talk with both of them. That's actually a good point. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Anyone else? Okay, so Amy, if you could just listen to the motion and make sure I get the numbers and the wording right. Um, may I have a motion, effective August 16, 2022, to approve a supplemental appropriation of the Firetown Sidewalk Local Transportation Capital Improvement Grant, OTSIP, in the amount of $1,200,000, a supplemental appropriation of the Connecticut Community Connectivity Grant, CCCGP, in the amount of $594,000 and a supplemental appropriation of $35,000 from the Capital Reserve Fund for a total project appropriation of $1.829 million. Would someone like to make that motion? So moved. Seconded by Art. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion carries unanimously. Um, when, before uh, before we just move on, when do you think we go to ground on that? Like, when are you going to start seeing building? Um, probably middle of next summer if things go well. Okay. Being that we have the two grants, there's some extra coordination that needs to take place. Okay. And we have staff capacity or we're hiring contractors, I assume, to do this? For the construction, we'll be 100% contractors. The design is going to be done fully in-house. Okay. That's the survey, of course. Okay. Um, moving on, we have a second supplemental appropriation for the LOTSIP Hot Meadow Street Connectivity Project. Um, that ha did have a prior appropriation in 2021 of 810000 so this is in addition to what was um, previously approved. Before us is a request to authorize a supplemental appropriation of LOTSIP grant for the Hot Meadow Street Project in the amount of $455,447.39 and um, to make a supplemental appropriation in the amount of $33,524.28 from the Capital Reserve Fund for a total project appropriation of $1,298,971.67. And the first question, of course, we're going to ask is, what's with the cents? <laughs> <laughs> this, this is through the, the uh, LATSIP process. It's going through DOT, and they are very precise. So forgive us for that, that uh, specificity. So in your submission, it looks like, you know, some of this project began applications in uh, 2018. Can you talk to sort of the time frame of... Uh, this project and why it wasn't budgeted? Well, the project has changed over the um, duration. Um, similar to what we are going to be doing on our Firetown Road sidewalk, we had some public information meetings with the um, business owners, very few homeowners in this area, business owners of the North End, and they had some asks that we were able to go back to the Capital Region Council of Governments and have included so that they expanded our grant request as a result of these asks, the most notable being adding street lighting to the north end. Um, originally thought we were only going to be able to put in conduits for future street lighting, but um, we were able to wrangle street lights into the project. And then due to the duration of the design and <coughs> unforeseen global issues, we've seen some cost increases. 
The nice thing is all of these increases in the change in scope is 100% covered by the grant. We've been, um, and we had a consultant doing the design on this one. One of the things I had talked with Amy, obviously, where we have two supplemental appropriations for almost $3 million six weeks into the new budget, and how do you budget for that when you haven't actually received a grant? And we're looking to sort of how Avon does it, and they budgeting sometimes the anticipated grants <coughs> a little bit more than we are. So that's one change we may see in next year's budget process. But um, just going back to our policy, and similar to all municipalities across state of Connecticut, if you get a new grant that doesn't impact the property tax, you can do a supplemental appropriation at any time. Uh, the reason why we're not doing transfers at this time is our charter limits transfers to after the first six months of the year. So we can't technically do a transfer right now, which is why we're doing an additional supplemental appropriation from capital reserves. Um, and that really took about four hours to figure out today. <laughs> <laughs> so please don't ask any questions about that. This, this is council's advice and we're gonna follow it. Um, and then mm. the other thing that sort of came up is because there is such an infusion of federal dollars, I think the lots of grant is federal dollars that come through the state that get transferred down to um, our municipalities. We've had more supplemental appropriations ever <coughs> since I've been in office, which is, I think I'm the most senior member here. <laughs> so for a long time. So one of the things we're gonna run up against is our charter has this quirk, which many charters do not, is that if you hit 3% of your budget as a supplemental appropriation, you have to go to referendum. So Bob is, and we're close to that. So Bob is working with Amy. So when we get to the Latimer appropriation in December, we may do a, add some of these projects to the referendum question so we get below the 3% in case there's a need later on in the year. So things are going to get a little bit complicated. Uh, worst case scenario is we might need to do extra supplemental appropriations at some point later in the future and then during charter review, this is obviously something we might want to reconsider <laughs> as a charter uh, requirement. So um, just so that the board knows that may be coming at some point. Um, and that's the reason these were some of the challenges we're juggling. So any other questions before I ask for a motion? So don't ask about that at Don't all. ask about the <laughs> please. I mean, I will go through is it if you want me is to. It, is it 3%? Uh, so what's the 3% on? Is it is it per referendum or is it? No, in, it's, it's in total, cumulative, correct? Yes. Yeah, so, so we will need, um, we will hit that 3% well, by the end of the year. Well, so we're going to do a supplemental appropriation on the Latimer project, so right. that won't count as the three percent anymore because it will have gone to referendum. Oh yes, okay, and so right, we may right, tag right, right. something okay. else on it to give us a little bit of a cushion there. So there are ways we can do it, and the other thing we can do is transfers after January first if there's savings, and not do a supplemental. They're they're, but they're coming up with a strategy with how to do this. I mean, as mm -hmm. Tom said, it's. Mm -hmm. An embarrassment of riches right now because there's so much federal dollars coming in it's drinking from a fire hose we've never had this problem before because we've never seen this kind of money it's ironic at a time when we're struggling to pay for Latimer but that one is a drip drip <laughs> so how do we balance those two is sort of uh, the big challenge Tom did you want to add to that no I think I think you, you bring up a good point and, and I, I can see a lot of different ways to approach this in years forward is when we have some of these grants that we know it's starting at this level but it's very likely that as you get deeper in the design it's going to grow do we ask for a bigger number and as opposed to doing a supplemental appropriation for more money it, which I seem to be doing a lot of lately do we instead do a bookkeeping um, change at the end to bring it to the right level yeah so that's you know we can talk about this later but that's how Avon does it they actually put in um, let's see if I actually I may have done that uh, yeah Avon recently budgeted about 10 million based on preliminary approval under lots of grant at the maximum award of 3 million and noted on the capital project she will be applying for other grant programs such as the community connectivity so there's a heads up to the public and that helps with the supplemental appropriations and there may be ways we can tentatively budget and then if the grant doesn't come in obviously you don't spend the money because we put in the capital project mm -hmm. sheet the source of the revenue so that may be a way to get it to avoid you having to come here so that's one thing we'll be looking at <laughs> it, just a minute oh sorry Art. go ahead you've been waiting go ahead, Art. Uh, a point well taken on the irregular flow of federal funds and so forth but 
if they come, we want to take advantage of them. So, all right, that, it's, it's uneven, it's lumpy, I got that. I, just a practical question for Mr. What, what is being connected here? This, is, um, this sidewalk is going essentially from um, Antonio's Plaza all the way north along the west side of the roadway up to the DOT maintenance facility, and then it's also going into the um, apartment complexes um, up at that end as well. Dorset Crossing, Dorset Crossing. all the way up. I couldn't hear your answer, Tom. Could you speak a little more loudly, please? Yep, Hoskins Road up into Dorset Crossing, and then it extends a little bit farther to the, um, the DOT garage. Part of that was because they're listed as a park and ride facility. Um, and it's actually gonna tie in well with some of the new development that we're hoping to see up there in the next couple of years. Um, and it's gonna, you know, again, make a lot of walkability for those businesses, so. And Tom, you had mentioned that you've met with the businesses, just going back to Firetown, I assume you're gonna send everyone a letter letting them know this is coming like you do when you do curbing or paving, is that right? Yep, yep, we'll, 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 and then from that, we'll look at what the response is and whether it's to have a public meeting or whether it's to answer questions one-on-one, -on -one. we'll kinda, you know, make a decision based upon um, the reaction that we get and, um, you know, I'm always a big fan of having one public meeting where neighbors get together, but we're flexible. Now, can you talk to us a little bit about how you chose these site? I mean, in the master plan, obviously, lists a number of new builds that we would like to consider. And just full disclosure, I was actually on that advisory committee many years ago, <laughs> <laughs> but um, have no financial interest in it in any way. But I bet it's worth mentioning that. Um, can you just talk about how you prioritize that as opposed to like walkways to Latimer or some other area? Yeah, um, it, it was really a, a good study in terms of they were looking at, you know, what are, what are some of your bigger generators? Schools, businesses, apartment complexes. Um, and with that, it kind of went into a matrix of where you have existing sidewalks and we identified several gaps and we said, okay, um, these, are, these are on our highest priority list, and then that kind of dovetails in with when we get the lot SIP solicitation where at times Simsbury doesn't always have a great pile of projects ready to go for the lot SIP pro program. Um, so, you know, we really look carefully at which of these projects are going to score the most points because if we're going to put in a grant, we want to get the grant. Um, so that, that's really how these come to be. Um, the Firetown Road one, like I said, there was, I was surprised at the amount of support that we, we received for that one. Um, the business community up in the North End was is, is very much in support of this um, this project. So, okay. thank you. That was helpful. And for folks who want to see uh, the pedestrian bicycle master plan, that is located on the Public Works Department page, and you can click on it and actually read it um, there for those who have an interest. <laughs> And so people always say to us, why do you do all this planning? And this is precisely why. It, it makes it for a better grant application and helps prioritize projects. Yep. It's setting the table to get the, the grants. That, you know, it's an investment to really capitalize on those grants. I just, uh, yeah. just administratively, and I'm sorry, I should probably know this, but what, when do we expect to get the grant in? So, right, um, or right, right now, we, we have the grant. We have, we have the money. Um, we, we have authorization for the money. Okay. So then so we a, request a series it. Of, of processes that we're going through right now where it, 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 it is um, meticulous and we have to get a, a project authorization letter. We need to have a uh, letter of authorizing us to bid. We've, we've gone to bid. We then need to get a, um, we need to have the DOT approve the contractor. Okay. We're in that process now. We are six weeks or so out from construction on the north end. Okay. And so... Just in, sorry, it's consistent theme. In the case of any cost overruns, there's a 20% contingency built into this. Okay, great. Okay, That's, yeah. And the the only last thing I'd say, just in terms of grants, and I, like I, I know uh, the list is long of keeping us informed. I, I would and, and grants usually come across as good guys to us. We find out once we've received them. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might be helpful just in terms of um, what grant, if knowing kind of what grants we've applied for, where we are in the process generally, maybe it's a every other month or quarterly update. And then we could e even, if it's, you know, very high level, get an understanding of, you know, what we think um, the likelihood is, the probability, 25, 50, 75, 100%, 
likelihood that it comes through within call it the next 12 months and then we have better we have better insight into how to budget for for stuff like that yeah, amy does update us on grants which i think is a great idea derek but amy if you could perhaps keep a running list so that we see them all because we I, I forget yeah. which ones have um been approved but i think derek's exactly right and then during the budget cycle we can say okay these were grants that we think we might get that we didn't budget and then the policymakers can say ah oh, maybe we should budget for it and mm -hmm. then if the grants don't come in we can make that decision collectively yeah. based on your evaluation as the likelihood of it coming in so Just, that may be uh, one thing and one more thing um derek to your point about um the cost and protecting ourselves mm -hmm. from the cost the contractor that bid on this project um, is, is locked into this pricing for the duration of the contract, oh, and right. we have a bid and performance bond, mm -hmm. so they cannot walk away from mm -hmm. this. That's great. So we have some additional assurances that you don't always get in, in other types of construction. Yep. Okay. Any other questions before I ask for a motion? And again, I'll go ahead and read the motion because this is on the advice of counsel and ask Amy to make sure that I've got uh, the motion correct. May I have a motion effective August 16, 2022 to authorize a supplemental appropriation of, lo of the lots of grant for the Hot Meadow Sidewick project in the amount of $455,447.39 and to authorize a supplemental appropriation from the Capital Reserve Fund of $33,524.28 for a total project appropriation of one million two hundred ninety-eight thousand nine hundred and seventy-one dollars and sixty-seven cents. <laughs> I'll make that motion. I'll Thank second. <laughs> and just to remind members of the public and myself, we had an earlier eight hundred and ten thousand appropriation in twenty twenty-one, which is how we get to the one point two million. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion carries unanimously. Aye. Thank you, Tom. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, now we go on to the second read of our policy updates. Um, it, as is our practice, we, every summer we do policy suggestions. We do a first read, give the public, other boards a chance to look and see if they have any comments, and Amy, if she has anything that she has concerns about or members have concerns. So we are in second reads of all of these. The first is proposed capital and non-recurring fund policy update. This is a second read with language suggested by Amy um, for administrative ease for small overages. Uh, you'll see the change on page 15 of your packets that she is proposing. The reason why we're doing that is because um, project appropriations are like their own department. So anytime there is an overage or you want to make a switch, you have to do a transfer. This would enable her to do this during the year and all at the end of the year will approve the transfers for a small amount. So she doesn't have to come to us throughout the year from minor 500 or even you know $1,000 appropriations. When there is savings in another project, we can just clean it up at the end mm -hmm. of the year instead of doing it piecemeal by piecemeal. So I was comfortable with that, but I wanted to see if anyone had comment on that or concerns. No, I was just the only comment I'd make on the you know the thresholds i think 20s um a, a a good number on the on the high end threshold i think five could go to 10. um again remember these are capital projects so some of the capital projects are only eight thousand ten thousand oh, dollars yeah. yeah. it's yeah. cnr it's not oh, okay. the cip yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah fair it, enough yeah. fair enough yeah this no, is just for cnr noted. not for the cip project so for minor <laughs> capital so between 10 and 250 i think is our range okay thanks but that may have a, oh, one thing since we have Wendy here, because this involves um, transfers and doing that at the end, technically your board would need to recommend the transfers to our board. So you would have to be in agreement with this. If your board chooses not to agree with this language, then Amy will have to, every time there's a minor overage, come to both boards throughout the year. So it will come to you guys for approval as well. If um, that, so do you have any questions on that before we take Okay. May I have a motion to approve the recommended changes to the capital and capital non-recurring fund policy and refer those changes to the Board of Selectmen for their consideration and approval? So I'll make motion. Second. Okay. Mike and then? Bert. Bert? Yeah, I second. Okay, any further discussion? Close out should be one word. Where is that? 
Ah, two places. With the minor spelling correction. <laughs> with the friendly amendment. With that, any other comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion aye. passes unanimously. This was um, made at the request by Ms. Schofield. Linda, thank you for that. Um, Amy updated language on the proposed investment policy updates. You can find those changes on page 16. Let's see, I think that's the only page, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Page 16 of the policy. Um, does anyone have any comments on that? Amy, um, you know, Linda made the suggestion that we can make that a little bit clearer, and Amy uh, took a stab at the language. I appreciate that. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. <laughs> I have a motion to approve the recommended the recommended changes to the investment policy as contained in our packets. I will move the changes as okay. written. Okay, Linda, can we put you down as a second? Okay. So moved by Art, seconded by Linda. Any further discussion? Just what was the reason for the change? I'm just reading the red line. It looks like it's pretty much the same. I, was there any ambiguity in the way that it was originally written? Um, Linda didn't feel like it was clear. Okay. So we just clarified it. Okay, that's it. All right. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. The third um, motion is a proposal for a structurally balanced budget. In my long hoped one day goal of getting the GFOA budget award, this is one thing that they <laughs> require, and they actually have a template of which to <laughs> base your proposed structurally balanced budget. So it's not a lot of creativity here, although I will do want to give credit to Bert, who wordsmithed it and made it read better than what nice. GFOA proposed, <laughs> and to Amy, who <laughs> reviewed the substance and made sure we were consistent with what the town's um, priorities are. So, are there any comments on that or changes? Okay. May I have a motion to approve the structurally balanced budget policy? So moved. Second. So Derek moves, seconded by Bert. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. Um, next, we have on the thing, and I do want to do this. I'm glad you're here, Neil. And um, we've got Todd Berg from the Board of Education, who is also here, to go over sort of a first run back of the napkin look at what the budget is going to look like and what the freight trains might mean for us. And Amy um, put together, as only she can, I give her something that's a mess and she's able to clean it up <laughs> and make it work. But what we tried to do is sort of look, what are the big movers of next year's budget? And you'll see debt service increase of 1.7 million, 300, right? You see the, um, Maria has proposed a CNR general fund increase of 1.845 million uh, based on capital needs that have been identified by department heads. You'll see normal, if we think about, okay, what might be a normal budget increase for the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Ed at two and a half percent, and I chose that because that's the limit that Massachusetts has, that would be about a 746,000 Board of Selectmen increase and a 1.9 for the Board of Ed. So that's just sort of normal. And if that happens, Based on Francine's projections, we're going to capture the three million plus. We have nine hundred thousand in new growth. Ta-da! What do we get, Amy? Not so bad, right? Budget increase, tax increase is not terrible because of the grand list growth. So you can see why the grand list great. So now we don't get any of the three million. Things come out terrible. What happens? Then we start to see um, tax increases of three hundred and forty-four to five hundred and forty thousand, five hundred and forty dollars a year, which would be the biggest tax increase we've had since I've been on the board of selectmen. So that gets terrifying. So let's go back up, and let's say, but that's not it. Let's look at the very worst thing: experience study. Oh no, it comes in terrible. We have an increase in our um, ARC payments because, based on the experience study, and Amy, pick a number: three hundred, five hundred. And let's do pension arc. Oh, our investments haven't been doing well. You know, we plan on them going up about 8% a year, but actually this year that it's probably going to need to go up 12% or honestly no idea. We have no idea. So, well, 
I would say add 200. Then let's think about the Board of Education budget. Dealing with COVID, oh, it's not going to be a 2.5% increase. It might be a 35 or a 4% increase this year. So that goes up another million. What happens if that happens? Just do like 4%. And now let's see what happens to our taxes. We go 5 to 800 increase in taxes. So that's sort of the uh, my breath is taken away situation. But then we have some good news. So we can well, do some offsets. Yeah. Well, offsets still on this page, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can do offsets. Because cause that, whatever, if you go up, the Maria ask is uh, without having seen any of it, just zero it out. That's right. So we would zero it out and use whatever capital reserves are ARPA money. So let's zero out Maria's request for the CNR. Okay, what does that do? That gets us better, 325 to 509, still the biggest tax increase in 13 years. Okay, but let's make it better. Let's go back up. One of the things, you'll see that Amy has already taken out the cash for capital, zeroed out. We have that already taken out. And that was our planned savings, if you remember, or members of the public may know. We knew this freight train was coming, so we did some planned smoothing of the mill rate and part of that was to zero out cash for capital so that's already been done so we can use capital reserves to fund some of what Maria's requested we're probably not going to be able to fund all of that we have health savings reserves if that goes up which mm -hmm. we anticipate it will going on there we'll be able to tap that so let's pick a number um, say it's somewhere in between Amy it's not the three million but she captures one and a half Francine? Yeah. Then that gets us down to 167 to 262. It gets something that we don't love, but maybe we could, we could handle. So you can sort of see how this is going to impact us. It could be a very bad year or it might be a manageable year, and it all depends on our assessor. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not suggesting that we're uh, that we're messaging in any way that two and a half percent is the target for either of those no. budget numbers. So um, I think those that's certainly on the table as well. Yeah, we'll have to look. I mean, one of the things we talked about with the Board of Ed is, you know, what do you care more about, capital or your operating budget? And they, you guys told us it's really important that we do this capital. And so a lot of the Board of Ed cost is in that 1.7%. Uh, debt service increase that's the Latimer right and and remind let's remind everybody what the magnitude of that pro total project cost is we're at 36 million and look and we may add another five somewhere or one and a half Call it 37 over 40 five, million yeah 38 so th that that's sort of the trains that are coming our way some of the things we're not going to have control of as as members of the public and I know staff is very well aware of um, salaries are often based on union contracts and so there's no flexibility there mm -hmm. you made a promise we keep it and so in terms of the flexibility there's not as much flexibility in the operating budget as the public may think there is mm -hmm. that's why the use of reserves to dr. Rinaldi's point you know when do we tap those reserves when it's raining well I think dr. Rinaldi was talking more about where we should be investing our research there's that as well and maybe yeah <laughs> Wendy so So that would be a, that would be in capital reserves because last year what okay. Amy did was she took it and applied it to normal costs or overruns and we parked it after. So it's already considered in this that the three and a half that we're getting. It's not considered in this. It's model. not okay. It would be it would be from capital reserves. We would t I have not separated it out. I would consider it part of capital reserves. You would move it, but yes, you could use that. You could use it for some of these. If capital. we don't use it for something else, which is right out there. Absolutely, for, but our board is, I think, going to be fairly insistent that if we do tap it, it be used for a one-time expense because it's a yes, one-time revenue source. But other than that, we would hope you would do that. Yes, <laughs> strongly encourage you to do that. And I know we're already planning well, to use some of it. We intend to use it for capital. Exactly. I mean, that's the. That's the 
the way we've been headed and the way we're planning to use it in the budget. So speaking on behalf of the town side of the budget, right? On the town yeah. side. But we may not be able to do that. Well, well, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. it, it's in a time of uncertainty because we have no idea what these numbers are going to come in and the magnitude. And, but these are the buckets we have to play with mm -hmm. and what we're going to be monitoring. Uh, and hopefully things are better than we expect. I'm always plan for the worst and hope for the best. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think, you know, you've seen the magnitude of the worst it could be. And I think it won't be the worst. It'll be somewhere in the middle. But I don't think we're coming in flat this year. But I could be, I could be totally wrong. So... We'll stand corrected on that. All mm -hmm. right. And then the last thing I did is I gave you all um, a sheet of paper where I pulled together what I think the requests I've heard from various board members um, throughout the years. And actually, Wendy gave me a few as well for budgetary requests. And I gave it to Amy. And we don't have to go through it all. Most of them are from the GFOA, Government Financial Officers Association Best Practices. Some of them are as simple as number of the budget book pages. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, one that they will not get to this year because it takes a long time to implement. But if we ever want to get the Government Financial Officers um, Association Budget Award, they do require that the budgets have performance metrics and measurements. And so just to start thinking about that, if you can't implement them, to please um, you know, think about a timeline that you would need or resources needed to develop that so that the public can sort of say, OK, what am I getting for my money? Public Works, how many roads did you do this year? How many? And how does that compare to previous years for police? How is our crime rate? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Are our dollars making a difference, or are they not? So just some metrics. We do a good job with goals in there, but they actually ask for performance metrics. So that's sort of the biggest ask that I know won't get done, because that's a lot of work, but it's something we, we could request people to think about. And um, Is that for both? Bo for board both. Of, yeah, yeah, for both. For yeah. the Board of Ed and yeah. the Board of Selectmen. Um, I know that the Board of Ed actually has done that in the past, and they have that, and we get that in some of their budget books as well. Um, then the other thing that's sort of the only change is when we go out to public hearing, there's no summary of the budget anywhere for the public to quickly do. They can go on our page and look at the legal war you know, warning that we put out. They can look at the Board of Selectmen budget book. They can look at the Board of Education book. But there's no one link. So I had asked Amy to combine um, just a link for the budget hearing budget that we're putting forward and that would include things that we already have but in draft form so it would be the budget warning which is that nice two-page summary that amy gave us um, the draft budget summary after we pass the budget we put up with the line items but we should put up a draft line item and then project sheets for all the capital in the current year of the cip so that the public can see what it is what capital projects we're approving so it's not creating new stuff but putting it all in one link so that the public has it in an easy budget page. And then the other thing that would be more work, but that's on us, would be to do a letter from the Board of Finance. So I'll send you guys a draft of that to help me with that. But if things come up later and people have more requests, we can add them. I did add um, on the CAP for Derek, if people haven't noticed, he is very What am I attuned. doing? You're very attuned to <laughs> contingency, so I added the cost line for contingency and capital project Thank you. costs. <laughs> So that's there. Um, and you can look at that. So this is over time. If you have more, we can add to that as well. Thank you. And then um, on the approval of the minutes, I sent Amy a couple minor changes, spelling um, and one word thing, but did that are inconsequential substantively. But did anyone have any other changes to the minutes? Okay. So we'll take those. I'll well, take a motion to approve the minutes with minor um, spelling changes. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Bert, seconded by Derek. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, that motion carries unanimously. Communications, we did get a number of communications. Um, there are the building department reports, annual receipts report, pension data summary by fiduciary by fiducian and market perspective summary by fiducian where we're getting a first look at how our investment's doing as, as with everyone else, not as not the 6.5% we had hoped for. Um, Amy, can you talk about the building department reports? Are our fees coming in 
according to budget would you say we're on track to hit the budget or no um, I don't know budget off the top of my head I did just note um, actually I think we're under budget if I remember from the last quarterly report um, so I just had highlighted here so the fiscal year 22 came in at 788,000 compared to fiscal year 21 which came in at 1.4 million right and then we had fiscal year 20 at 753,000 so if you recall we had a couple larger projects in fiscal year 21 that was kind of an outlier year so we're more in line with the um, construction related to the fiscal year 20 period which is more in line with typically where we've been I believe we budgeted I want to say 800,000, but don't quote me on that. So I think we're going to come in a little bit less than, than what we had budgeted for 22. Okay. Thanks. That's really helpful. Does anyone have any other questions? Brett, did you have a question? No, I didn't. Does anyone else have a question on communications? All right. So with that, Amy, and I am missing in my book the motion pursuant to what to go into executive session for the no, board. No, you actually don't have to go into executive session. You can adjourn, and then there's just a note at the end of the agenda that's following adjournment. Board of Finance will be discussing with staff um, negotiation strategies. Ah, that's not a requirement. It's, it doesn't count as a meeting. Right. All right. So that's excellent. So we are actually at the conclusion of our meeting. Then may I take a motion to adjourn? So moved. Mike. Seconded by Mike, so made by um, Derek. All in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion carries um, unanimously, and we will move into a closed-door um, discussion on collective bargaining.